Palina Mukul Shalashwam. It's nice to see you. Uh, welcome. Uh, and we will be covering my research project, uh, looking at, the, at these posture courses um, over these last 16 months. Here's our agenda with five bullets. However, only five. There's a lot of road to cover. What we have here is a mandated language training from the commanding general in Afghanistan stating every soldier will go into country before deployment with at least a little bit of language background to be able to win the hearts and minds, as many of you have heard before. But to a limited proficiency, nothing uh, out of the ordinary. So the original uh, piece uh, born of that was 16 weeks. Why 16? It was arbitrary. Somebody said 16 weeks. So in order to accommodate uh, the units uh, for their deployment timelines, they, some would say, we just can't do it. Can we do 10? Can we do 12? Can we do 14? Which the answer is yes, for their support. The funny thing is, they started getting scores as good as or better than the 16-week courses. So it leads me to ask the question, why? Why is this the way it is? And this is what gave birth to my or my project here. So three I had three classes to study on the hook, two in Texas and one in New York. So I had to start looking into the literature to see what the academic community had been saying. Now, of course, more time on target means higher achievement. Is that true? All of our anecdotal evidence stated otherwise. We had nine-week courses doing as well as 15-week <coughs> courses. Something to look at. Age, does age make a difference? Notice I didn't put old up there, but more experience. <laughs> Literature stated, well, in a short period of time, the people who are younger learn quicker. However, the older person tends to catch up. I needed to see if that was the case. Motivation, student motivation was huge in, in literature review. All stating, the more motivated the student, even if they're doing poorly in class, they still are motivated to learn, and chances are, not most of the time, but not all, they will win out and do fairly well in that particular course. Uh, prior knowledge of, of a foreign language. Uh, literature, once again, said the more knowledge you have, the better. You are more in tune with learning foreign grammar and structures and so on and so forth. But the last one you see up there was the one that I really wanted to look at. When I was discussing with colleagues, they had told me, Gender has not been done in relation to foreign language. So that was the one I wanted to dig into. All of this led me into these three questions. Statistically significant differences between the three classes. 10 weeks, 14, and 16. Is the curriculum adequate to, to get the course goals? 70% in listening, reading, and speaking, all three parts of the test. Okay, and then, then lastly, what affects the test scores, which going back to the age and the prior language experience and so forth. But before I could answer these questions, I had to learn who my participants were. I had 103 total. I had two classes in Texas. Uh, one class of 27 were mixed male and female. I had one class of 26 females. And then in New York, I had a class of 50. I had 22 instructors, 12 in Texas. 10 in New York, over a vast, uh, there were a vast variety of, uh, of ethnic and tribal backgrounds. It was very interesting to work with those folks. For gathering information, simple demo, uh, demographic surveys to find out education levels, where they came from, uh, gender was pretty obvious, um, high school education, so on and so forth, to see what they've done before they come into class and whether or not they had posture before. Uh, the inventory, short for the motivational inventory that they took that you see up here on this side, is just a short snippet of 22 questions of how they felt they learned the language, not actually how they did. And believe it or not, some test scores bared up that they did as well as what they thought they did. Oh, and interviews. Uh, interviews with instructors and both students uh, to help uh, gain information on how curriculum was and how they felt the classes went. Which leads me into the results for the first question. 
statistically significant differences? Yes, there were. Uh, in the following slide, you'll, you'll get a practical example of what I'm talking about. But in that second bullet, you see 14 versus 16 greater than, not equal to, 16. They did better in the listening. 10 weeks versus 16 weeks. Reasons why it could be instructors, it could be the students. There are, there are a great number of factors that could be involved. But this question of all three, this is the policy changer right here. This is something to take forward to higher headquarters to be able to make changes to the program. Now, for those who can't see, it looks like it's pretty, it's pretty decent size up here. But you look at this analysis of variance in the middle, the average. That the 10 week averaged 27 points out of 40. 14 week 26 and so on. And this little guy down here called the p-value. For those who don't know what that little guy stands for, the magic number is 0 0.05. If it's lower than that, that means your uh, difference is significant. Okay, the question two, was the curriculum adequate? Mostly. You see that the reading and the speaking we're right on target. Uh, total score, uh, don't pay so much attention to because people have to pass each, each modality, but the listening lagged, so clearly indicating that we needed to change the curriculum a little bit. Question three, the fact <laughs> is, I like that one too. For, for this particular study, age had no bearing on what happened with this study. That's regardless of having an age range of 18 to 52, not a difference. Student motivation, one third, one quarter to one third of all test scores hinged upon how the students felt about how they were doing in class. Prior exposure to foreign language, not a surprise. The students who had prior exposure, and it could have been um, ESL, it could have been sign language, had clearly outperformed the others who didn't have, who didn't have anything. But then gender, the one that became my, my pet project, you can see listening, upper left, reading, lower left, and then speaking upper right, and then, and then total test scores in lower right. The females not only beat the men, but roundly whipped the men. Okay? As you can see up here in the mean, for the female male, variable, or male female speaking, almost seven point difference. Seven point difference. That is absolutely amazing. Okay, for the listening, not as much, but this, to me, this truly, it, it requires more study to, to get more out of it, to see what it is. It may just be this class, I'm not sure, but I'm actually told females do learn better than males mostly, so, sorry guys. <laughs> so what are implications? Your implications are policy change um, in, in these economic times. The, the government's cracking down, less money for people, um, so less money, shorter deployments, um, you know, getting everything ratcheted up so, you know, we don't have to pay as much. Curriculum revision, great thing. Ratchet things down. Make sure that, that everybody has the appropriate uh, uh, materials in order to get the job done. Now, the limitations with the instructors. The instructors become very subjective. It's like a mother-father or a mother-father and, and child uh, relationship where they don't want them to do bad. Now, of course, in the MISS program, we didn't have that. We had the uh, mom and dad who came down with a hammer. Like a <laughs> but um, they, they tended to lose their objectivity when grading, especially for the speaking test, um, to, to say, this is what he meant, this is what she meant, and that, that doesn't work. Um, student participation units getting closer to deployment, they get yanked out of, of class to take care of I don't want to call them frivolous things, but things that need to be done before they go out the door to Afghanistan. And then, as I mentioned, the objective testing. They don't know what is on the listening test, so they tend to do poor on that. Uh, but they're put in familiar situations with a speaking test. So using that, they know what they're going to say, and many of those phrases are memorized. So you want to do a research project. Well, let me tell you, I have three things for you. It is time intensive, and I can't say that enough. If you have a timeline, stick to it. If you have to adjust it, you, you better rethink it, of whether or not you readjust it, and then give us a sanity check to your advisor, and if he or she says no, then eat it. And 
stay on your timeline. Because like Dr. Tao said, it's very intense for the final project. Your participants, uh, one of two things. If you have a kind of a, a one and done, you, know, you go out and get your stuff, they sign, and then you go, um, that's good. The more you interact with them at any particular point, they can pull their, uh, their um, agreement to stay with you. It's entirely voluntary. You can't force them to stay. And then statistics. This one is my last one, my favorite one. Um, the quote from yesterday, or the other day, is whoever fights with monsters must be sure that in the process he himself does not become a monster. And it, as long as you look in the abyss, the abyss looks back into you. That's statistics. I didn't care for statistics very much at all in the beginning, but by the time I was finished, I wasn't afraid of ANOVA and SPSS and team testing and so on and so forth. So it's doable, just know what you're getting yourselves into. Are there any questions? I told you no one would I would like to thank the faculty, especially Dr. Sue, for taking time to help me out. Uh, the team, wherever you are, you're all speckled out there. You know who you are. And, and Cindy, I don't care what anyone says, you're still part of us. Thank you for putting up with the insanity. And for my, my dear family here, my wife, and, and you're my favorite, my all. I love you, Munches.